Waves are clever because they all transfer energy without transferring matter. They don't actually transfer the stuff that they're traveling through. So if you're in the ocean and a wave comes along, by the way, this is what we call a progressive wave. Progressive wave is one that actually moves. If you're in the ocean and you're there, you can't go with the wave, you're just gonna go up and down. You're always going to follow the top of this wave. At the moment, you're on a peak, and then when the wave moves along, you're gonna end up in a trough. You're just gonna move up and down. You are being supplied with energy because you're moving up and down. The water is going up and down. That's what's making you move up and down. But the water itself is not moving. It's just the wave is moving. If the water moved as well, you would move as well, but you're just going up and down. So that's what we mean by it transfers energy without transferring matter. The water is not moving to the right, just the oscillations or the vibrations are. Now what we do is apply this real wave that we can see in real life to all sorts of different waves in physics. Now we have two types of waves. We have transverse and we have longitudinal. Transverse waves actually look like this, like a water wave. The oscillations go up and down, but the wave goes that way. In other words, the direction of wave propagation posh word propagation it just means the way that it's moving the wave is moving the direction of wave propagation is perpendicular to the oscillations and in that we have EM waves that's electromagnetic waves water waves waves on a string All sorts of waves there. Also, S waves. Secondary waves in the Earth. Seismic waves. The S stands for secondary seismic waves though. Longitudinal is a little bit more tricky. This is where we actually have not something that actually looks like a proper wave in this case, but we actually have bits of matter. So this could be particles in the air, or it could be particles in the ground they're actually being compressed. Compressions there, or rarefacted. Rarefactions is just the opposite of a compression. You might think about this as being called um, decompressions instead. Here, the particles are being squashed together. Here, the particles are being spread out. This is like what we have with the slinky when you push it. Uh, along the way that the wave is going. The oscillations are going side to side, but the wave is also going that way. So in this case, the direction of wave propagation is parallel. Oh, I can't spell today. To oscillations. Oscillations, just posh word for vibrations. Sound waves. When a speaker produces sound, it actually pushes the particles in the air. The particles at the speaker aren't going to your ear, but the compressions and rarefactions are. P waves, P seismic waves. So we have these types of waves and these types of waves in the earth. These ones are faster than S waves. And when it comes to these types of waves, we can actually see what's going on with the wave. With these, it's a little bit more tricky because every time you want to draw a sound wave, you don't want to be drawing these lines and these particles. So what we do is that we represent what's going on with a wave that looks like a transverse wave, but this is just a model of what's going on. Peaks are compressions. Troughs are rarefactions. And suddenly it becomes a lot easier to see what's going on with our wave. So whether you have a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave, they can both be represented by a wave form by drawing it like this. So what does our wave actually show us then?
Well, I haven't drawn something on here yet, and that's the line of equilibrium. This is the line above and below which our oscillations happen. We either have a waterway going above where it would be if it wasn't oscillating, below where it would be, symmetrically about this equilibrium. Here we have sound particles, if this is a longitudinal wave, getting compressed and then being rarefacted. And then if there was no sound wave at all, then we just have a flat line where the equilibrium is. And don't forget that this wave is actually propagating. It's moving to the right. Now, what can we tell from this then? Well, the height of the wave from the equilibrium point, that's what we call amplitude. We can also call this the maximum displacement from equilibrium. When a particle's here, it's not displaced from equilibrium, but when it reaches the top, and it will when this wave moves along, then it reaches amplitude. Amplitude is just the maximum displacement. It's the top of the peak. And obviously, that's the same going down to the trough. I haven't drawn it very symmetrical there, but you get the idea. What else do we know? We know that the distance from one peak to the next is going to be the same all throughout this whole wave. And that goes from trough to trough as well, and from midpoint to midpoint. And we call that the wavelength. Wavelength is the distance from one peak to the next. We give that the symbol lambda, which is a sort of uh, upside down capital Y. That's a Greek letter, lambda. This wave is also traveling at a speed V. If it's a speed, then it's just gonna have units meters per second. You can write that as M slash S as well, but I'm doing it in the A level way here. Let's find out one more thing. If I had a line here which measured how many peaks or how many complete waves were passing this point every second, that's what would give me my frequency. Just like buses, if you have a buses that have a frequency of twice every hour, that means that two buses come along every hour. With waves, we talk about frequency. We give it the, the symbol F, measuring in hertz, which is the same as seconds to the minus one per second. All that means is the number of waves passing a point or being produced every second. Now there is an equation that links together three of these things, but not amplitude because amplitude doesn't really affect uh, what's going on with the speed of the wave. But here is the wave equation. That is V equals F times lambda. Wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Wave speed measured in meters per second. Frequency measured in hertz or seconds to the minus one. Wavelength is meters, so the units work out meters per second. And so that gives us wave speed. To rearrange that, if you're GCSE, you can get away with putting that into a triangle, V on top, F and lambda on the bottom. But if you're A-level, you should be pretty au fait with rearranging this on the fly. So just one small thing. Generally, V is constant for a wave, or for a type of wave, I should say. So for EM waves, the speed is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, 300,000 meters per second. That never changes for the speed of light, speed of EM waves, unless it goes into another medium. So that means that F and lambda compensate for each other. So if F goes up, in order for the speed to stay the same, lambda has to go down and vice versa. So that means if F doubles, what has to happen to lambda? It has to half, and vice versa as well. You get the idea with that. So nice and simple. If you know that one of these things is changing, whether it's doubling or tripling, the other one has to do the opposite. Polarization is the attenuation, in other words, reducing, of 
transverse waves oscillating in a particular orientation. So if I was to draw an EM wave, then strictly speaking, because it's an EM wave, we should draw an oscillating electric field. And we should draw a perpendicularly oscillating magnetic field. This is the magnetic field, B. And this is my electric field, E. It's propagating in this direction. This is how we model an EM wave. But for the sake of polarization, we're going to just pretend that we're dealing with the electric field, say. So instead of having two fields oscillating, we're just gonna pretend that there's only two dimensions to this electric field. Now, because it oscillates like this, if you have this wave and you try and send it through a grating that has lots and lots of slits like that, it's actually going to end up being blocked. So it's not going to carry on going through. If, however, we did have the same wave and instead we turned the grating 90 degrees. So now the slits are going up like that. The wave would carry on going straight through. This is called polarization. Now in reality, we're going to have not only waves coming from uh, a non-polarized source, we're not going to have, say, waves coming from the sun that are just oscillating this way. They're going to be oscillating horizontally as well. They are going to get blocked like that. By only letting waves that are oscillating in a particular orientation through, we now say that the light coming through being transmitted, transmitted just means being allowed through, being transmitted through this Polaroid filter, this grating here that has been polarized. Naturally, if I then take this filter here, where the lines are going horizontally, it's going to stop all light going through. It's going to stop the light oscillating horizontally through here, and this filter here is going to stop the vertically oscillating light. How can this be used? If you're in a car and you have Polaroid sunglasses, sort of look like this. Very cool. When you have the road, the light coming from the sun is going to be oscillating in all sorts of different directions, but we're just going to concentrate on two of them. So we've got light coming down like that, oscillating vertically. And we got light that's oscillating horizontally as well. Which one of these is going to be reflected by the road? It's actually the one that's oscillating horizontally like that. That's going to go into your eyes like so. Think about skimming stones. You don't skim a stone go like that. You skim a stone by flicking it sideways like so. So if you want to stop glare from the road, then you need to stop this horizontally polarized light coming off the road from going into your eyes. Which way do you want the slits in your Polaroid sunglasses? You want them vertically. That's going to allow light coming from directly from the sun, half of it to go into your eyes, but it's going to stop a load of the light being bounced, reflected off the surface of the road from entering your eyes so you can see the road more clearly. Naturally, it's only transverse waves that can be polarized because you try and polarize a longitudinal wave is just going to pass straight through the Polaroid filter. Longitudinal waves can't be polarized, it's only transverse waves that can. So there you go, that's my introduction to waves for you. If you think I've missed anything out or if you have any questions, then please put them in the comments below and I'll see you next time.